Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, and this is Last Week in the Church. You know, I keep waiting for that period in which we're going to have a slow news week, and I won't have a lot to talk about. Hasn't happened in a year and a half, and it's certainly not the situation today. There is a lot to do. So here's what we've got. We begin with a shot across the bow. So right now, Israel and Hamas are firing real shots one another after Hamas's surprise attack on Israel over the weekend. But at the same time, the Israeli embassy to the Vatican has fired a metaphorical shot across the bow at Pope Francis and his diplomatic team. We'll explain what they said and why they said it. Second, we've got the sound of silence. Well, not really. Pope Francis has attempted to impose a kind of cone of silence over his keenly anticipated and highly contentious Synod of Bishops on Synodality that is going on right now in Rome. However, that silence really has not held. There is a great deal that is being said. We'll bring you the latest. Third, the calculus of the clergy. One of the issues that has emerged in the Synod of Bishops is shortages of priests and seminarians in some parts of the world. But we're going to bring you the map about where priests are and where they aren't, and hint, hint, it's probably not what you think. Fourth, we've got the defense has its day. Right now, in the Vatican's trial of the century, this is the trial against 10 defendants, including for the very first time, a cardinal of the Catholic Church for various alleged financial crimes. Defense lawyers are delivering their summary statements, their closing arguments, raising issues not only about the substance of the charges, but also due process concerns. We're going to bring you what is being said and what I would consider a strong candidate for the Catholic soundbite of the year. I'm going to bring that to you today. And finally, we're going to close with great news, but unfinished business. One of Crux's own, our managing editor, Charlie Collins, is finally home after five months in the hospital, but that doesn't mean he doesn't need help anymore. I'm going to explain what's going on there. All that and more is waiting for you on this edition of Last Week in the Church, so please, for the love of God, in the name of all the angels and the saints, in the name of the Madonna del Rosario, the Our Lady of the Rosary, and this is her month, Don't go anywhere. Don't leave. Don't walk away. I guarantee you this is stuff you need to know. So, notoriously, intelligence and wisdom are not the same thing. It is actually possible to be incredibly smart and also incredibly foolish. Footnote, it is also possible to be a total idiot and a great fool. My life is sort of a laboratory experiment in what happens when both of those things are true. But that's not our point here today. Our point here today is that history is replete with examples of the great mischief that can result when intelligence and wisdom become decoupled. If you want a refresher course in this point, by the way, I recommend you go see the brilliant new movie Oppenheimer, which is basically a three-hour meditation on precisely this point. However, the contrary is also true. That is, if disaster is often the result when intelligence and wisdom separate, Triumph and amazement is often what happens when intelligence and wisdom come together. And this is a roundabout setup for a naked commercial plug, because I'm here today to recommend a new piece of technology to you. It's a new app called Magisterium AI. And basically, it is an effort to combine intelligence, in this case, artificial intelligence, with the great spiritual and ethical wisdom of Catholic teaching. It is an app that is by now trained on more than 3,000 official church documents. It is available in 10 languages, so pretty much any tongue you would, you know, wish to get an answer in. And what you can do is you can go on to this app and ask it questions, ranging from really high-end egg-headed stuff to, like, explain the doctrine of transubstantiation or what were the issues in the Arian heresy all the way down to the kinds of banal things that real people would ask, like, what's the deal with the Pope? Or, you know, the Virgin Mary, do you guys worship her? Like, what's the thing? You know, whatever your question is, this tool will give you cogent, insightful, well-written answers. So 
whether you are a priest who needs talking points for a homily, or you're a CCD teacher who has that one precocious kid in class that won't stop asking you questions. And speaking as the former precocious kid in class, I know how a annoying that slice of life can be. I raised it to a fine art. You know, whatever, you know, whatever your needs may be. I mean, if you're just an ordinary person with questions about the Catholic Church, because I don't know, you read a Dan Brown novel or you watched Godfather 3 or whatever it is. This tool will be extraordinarily useful to you. It is the brainchild of our friends at Longbeard. That's a digital marketing and design company. They are the IT backbone of the Crux site and also of last week in the church. These people are geniuses. And beyond that, they're also salt of the earth, great people. And so whatever they touch basically turns to gold. This is the latest example of it. I highly recommend it to you. Now, I'm not going to promise that if you, you know, use it, and by the way, you should, it's at magisterium.com. That's magisterium.com. I'm not going to promise you a full refund if you're not satisfied because it's free. So you don't actually have to pay anything. What I will promise is that if you don't like it, you are free to send me a note telling me that. I will use another AI app to generate an automated response in which I have no rule whatsoever. I'm actually just kidding. I would pass your response along because I guarantee you the people at Longbeard want to get this right. So again, check it out. That is Magisterium AI online at magisterium.com. By the way, if this didn't convince you, and frankly, it's me, so why should it convince you? But if you want a more intelligent presentation of the argument for this, read my wife Elise's article on the Crux site. It is replete with insight and elan and verve, and it will lay out the case in very compelling fashion. Magisterium.com. Check it out. All right, everybody. Happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, October 10th in the year of our Lord, 2023. We begin with the sad reality of a new spiral of war in the Holy Land. On Saturday, Hamas launched what amounts to a sneak attack on Israel on the 50th anniversary of another sneak attack that launched the 1973 Yom Kippur War. And in the middle of all of that, what we have is new tensions between Israel and the Vatican regarding how the Vatican is going to respond to this conflict. The latest in terms of what's going on is that after the Hamas attack on Saturday, the current count as of this recording, and frankly, by the time you see this, I'm sure the numbers are going to be even higher. But as of Monday, when we record this video, an estimated 700 Israelis have been killed, an estimated 400 Palestinians have been killed, some 100 Israelis are believed to have been taken hostage, and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel has warned the citizens of his country to dig in for a long war. That's where we are. Now, as this conflict broke out on Saturday, in terms of the Vatican dimension of all of this, what is especially interesting is that the Israeli embassy to the Holy See, and remember that the Vatican and Israel have had diplomatic relations since 1993 when they signed a fundamental agreement. The Israeli embassy to the Vatican put out a statement. And in essence, what this statement said, it was, again, it was a metaphorical shot across the bow. What it said is that what we do not need in this situation are what they described as linguistic ambiguities. And we do not need suggested parallelisms. And what they, were, what they meant was that they were telling the Vatican, do not equate the aggressor in this conflict, which of course Israel would believe to be Hamas, a group they would describe as a terrorist organization, with the victims of the conflict. What they said is that the only possible way to describe what Israel is doing right now in its military response to this invasion is the exercise of its legitimate right to self-defense. And any other kind of verbal formula to talk about this situation 
according to the Israeli statement to the Vatican, would be, they said, this is not diplomatic pragmatism, it is simply wrong. Okay? Now, what is this about? Well, it is about two different things. One, historically, Israel has had a, well, what can only be described as deep reservations about the Vatican's approach to the Middle Eastern conflict. The Vatican has always supported a two-state solution, that is, the recognition of Israeli sovereignty, but at the same time, also the recognition of a Palestinian state. And they have also supported a special status for Jerusalem under international law with particular guarantees for the holy sites, which are considered holy, of course, by the world's three great monotheistic religions, that is, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Now, that approach has always rankled some in Israel who believe that the Vatican is engaged in a kind of moral equivalence between terrorism on the one hand and legitimate self-defense and security interests on the other. In the run-up to this conflict, we should say, Pope Francis just created a new cardinal in the Holy Land. He named Italian Archbishop Pier Battista Pizzaballa, who was the Latin Rite Patriarch of Jerusalem, as a cardinal in his consistory on September 30th. Pizzaballa, even before this war broke out, was warning of the possibility of a new spiral of violence in the Holy Land, saying it was a mistake on the part of Israel and the international community, by which I think he meant largely the United States, to engage Hamas in dialogue, saying that the fact of the matter is that Hamas governs two million people on the Gaza Strip, and you can't simply pretend that's not the case. So what we're left with is a situation in which Israel, which has historic objections to the Vatican's attempt to be even-handed in terms of the conflict between Israel and Hamas, between Israel and the Palestinians, is because of this new spiral of violence especially sensitive. You have to add to that the context of the war in Ukraine, where the criticism of the Vatican and of Pope Francis in particular, is that in his effort to be even-handed and to preserve the possibility that the Vatican could be a mediator in this conflict, critics would say that he's failed to make a clear distinction between the aggressor, i.e. Russia, and the victim of that aggression, i.e. Ukraine. And basically, this is Israel warning the Vatican that you cannot pull a Ukraine on us. You cannot roll out this same script of trying to be even-handed, of trying to strike a balance between the contending parties, because we believe that we are the victims, we are the righteous party in this conflict, and we're not going to allow you to get away with suggesting that terrorism and self-defense are essentially the same thing. Now, That statement came out on Saturday. On Sunday, Pope Francis addressed this conflict during his traditional noontime Angelus address. And among other things, the Pope said that terrorism and war never produce any good results. He said all they lead to is death and the suffering of innocents. And this was, of course, in the context of praying for peace. Honestly, the great likelihood is that Israel was not particularly thrilled with that comment because it seemed a sort of equal condemnation of terrorism, i.e. the Hamas attack on Israel, but also war. And let us remember that this was right after Prime Minister Netanyahu had declared that Israel was at war against Hamas. Going forward, where does this leave us? Well, I think what it suggests is that the Vatican is going to try to do what it always does, which is maintain lines of communication with both sides in the conflict, that is, both Israel and also the Palestinians, including Hamas, and that that is going to deeply irritate certainly Israel in terms of how it thinks about this conflict. I would note, by the way, one of the ironies here is that 
the Vatican's point man on this conflict, that is, new Cardinal Pizzaballa, is currently in Italy. He came to get his red hat on September 30th. Then he went to Bergamo, that Bergamo, that's his hometown where his family lives. By the way, also the hometown of Pope John XXIII, the Pope who convened the Second Vatican Council. He's trying currently to get back to Jerusalem. Many people, even before this conflict broke out, believed that Pizzaballa might be a credible candidate to be the next pope himself. This conflict, ironically, certainly not what he would have desired, has nevertheless created a platform in which the efforts of Pizzaballa to be a kind of mediating force in this conflict, to be someone who can try to bridge the divide between the two sides, that is going to have an intense global spotlight. His performance in the next few days and in the weeks to come will certainly be keenly scrutinized and may actually not only affect the war that is now underway, it also might affect the politics of the next papal election. We will see. All right, second up this week, the sound of silence. So Pope Francis, for the Synod of Bishops on Synodality that is currently going on in Rome, has attempted to impose a kind of cone of silence over the whole thing. In the Regolamento, that is the rule book which the Vatican issued for this synod, participants, and there are 464 of them, by the way, this includes not merely bishops, but also priests, nuns, lay people. It's no longer a synod of bishops, it's more like a synod with bishops. And all of those participants, under the rules, are now prohibited not only from talking about what others are saying inside the Senate, they're prohibited from talking about what they themselves are saying inside the Senate. This is an utterly new secrecy requirement that never existed before, and it has generated no small amount of controversy among people who wonder, for a pope who has said from the very beginning that transparency is supposed to be one of the hallmarks of his regime, why is the Synod so, relatively speaking, non-transparent? Now, the thing of it is, however, none of that has stopped the fact, the reality, that there is a great deal of public conversation about this Synod. We spoke last week about how five conservative cardinals, including American Cardinal Raymond Burke, had submitted a set of critical questions technically known as dubia, to Pope Francis ahead of this synod, covering issues such as the teaching authority of the synod, the blessing of same-sex unions, women clergy, communion for the divorced and remarried. And the remarkable thing about all that is that the Pope responded to those dubia and those responses were made public. Now, in addition, since last we spoke, it also emerged that Cardinal Dominic Duca of the Czech Republic, the former Archbishop of Prague, now retired, had also submitted a set of dubia to Pope Francis regarding communion for divorced and civilly remarried Catholics in the wake of his 2016 document Amoris Laetitia, to which the Vatican, not the Pope in this case, but the Vatican's dicastery for the doctrine of the faith has also responded. And, you know, basically, if I can sum all this up, what the Pope said on same-sex unions is, yes, we can bless them on a case-by-case -case basis as long as it's not confused with marriage. We shouldn't have a general policy. On women clergy, he said, for now the answer is no, but it needs more study. And what the Vatican said on communion for the divorced and remarried is that, yeah, again, on a case-by-case -case basis, these people can receive communion because there may be elements that mitigate their subjective moral responsibility for the breakdown of their previous marriage. In other words, what has happened is that all of the issues we thought would be most contentious in the Senate have, in effect, been taken off the table because answers have already been given. Now, what is that, where does that leave the Senate of Bishops? Well, one way of looking at it is there's really not a lot to do <laughs> anymore. Like the issues we all thought were going to be most important you know, they no longer matter. On the other hand, another way of looking at it is the real purpose of the Senate all along was never to settle a narrow list of debated issues. It was to imagine a new way of being church, one that is more 
consultative, participative, participatory, and dialogic. And maybe now a space has been cleared in which they can have that conversation without getting bogged down in these stale controversies. Now, you can look at that any way you want, but the truth of it is, today, after the opening act of this Senate over the last few days, this is a very different conversation than we thought it was going to be. Where it is going to go, we don't yet know, but it appears much more wide open, ergo, much more predictable, therefore, in some ways, much more interesting. We will see. Third up, one of the issues we do know that has come up in the Senate of Bishops is the issue of priest shortages and seminarian shortages. We heard in a briefing from Italian layman Paolo Ruffini, who was the head of the Vatican's Dicastery for Communication, and who was also the official spokesman for the Senate of Bishops, that this issue had come up. Then, this past Saturday, Ruffini trotted out a couple of participants in the Senate, including Cardinal Fridolin Ambongo from the Democratic Republic of Congo, by the way, Cardinal Lombongo is a member of the Capuchins, my favorite religious order. I was formed by the Capuchin Franciscans out in the high plains of western Kansas, so I have a special fondness for these guys. In any event, Cardinal Lombongo was asked about this discussion about shortages of seminarians in the Senate, and he said, yes, this did come up. And he said, it's not really our problem, however, Because he said in Kinshasa, for instance, and he really meant across Africa, but he was using Kinshasa as his example, said in Kinshasa, we have 130 seminarians. So our seminaries are hardly empty. By the way, if you want a term of comparison, Kinshasa is one of the largest archdioceses in Africa. Now, let's take the largest in terms of Catholic population, the largest archdiocese in the United States, which is the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. You know how many seminarians they have? 53. Kinshasa has 130, okay? In other words, more than twice as many. And so Mbongo's point was that this may be a problem in some parts of the world, particularly in the affluent, developed West. However, it's not really our problem. Now, that's true so far as it goes, but here's a bit of math you should bear in mind, and this is probably food for discussion within the Senate of Bishops, because the fact that there are a lot of seminarians in Africa and that Africa is generating a large number of priests these days could lead many of us to the conclusion that Africa is priest-rich, right? That Africa has a lot of priests we don't. Well, you know, the truth is exactly the opposite, ladies and gentlemen. Do you know what the priest-to-person ratio in the United States is? That is, the ratio of priests to Catholics in the United States, it's 1 to 1,300. That is, in the United States, we have one priest for every 1,300 Catholics. Do you know what it is in Western Europe? It's 1 to 1,700. Do you know what it is in Sub-Saharan Africa? It is 1 to 5,100. It's 5,100. Do you know what it is in Latin America? It's 1 to about 7,000. And the reason for this is, if we take Africa as an example, you would think, well, the church is growing, therefore it's got to be lousy with priests. Well, here's the thing. Yes, the church is growing dramatically in Africa, but when the church is growing dramatically, it exacerbates priest shortages. It doesn't correct them because the Catholic Church can baptize people much more rapidly than we can ordain them. It takes about five minutes to baptize someone. It takes at least four years to ordain them. So when the church grows, we end up with worse worse pre-shortages, not better ones. Now, my point is simply this, that in the West, and I think especially in the United States, we have become accustomed to thinking that we can solve our pre-shortages by importing priests from the developing world. Well, the reality is that when we do that, in a sense, however much of a richness these guys are, we are actually making the pastoral situation in the developing world much worse. Let me put it to you this way. Right now, in 2023, two-thirds of the Catholic population in the world lives in the Southern Hemisphere, but two-thirds of the Catholic priests in the world are in the Northern Hemisphere. 
And many of them are priests from the South who have come to the North to fill perceived holes in affluent dioceses. If the Catholic Church were a company, we would immediately reallocate our management to where our market was growing, right? That's corporate logic. Now, of course, the Catholic Church doesn't roll that way, but nevertheless, a question that this Senate is going to have to consider is the equity of a situation in which the affluent part of the church is poaching clergy from the impoverished part of the church in order to make our lives easier on the backs of and at the expense of our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, if this Senate of Bishops can get around to talking about that, that would be a conversation well worth having. Fourth up this week, we have the defense has its day. So the Vatican's trial of the century, this trial against 10 defendants, including for the very first time, a cardinal of the church, Italian Cardinal Angelo Becciu, for embezzlement and other alleged forms of financial crime, is in its home stretch. Right now in the month of October, this will continue into November, Defense attorneys are given, being given the opportunity to present their closing arguments. This last week, we heard from two sets of defense attorneys, one representing Cecilia Marogna, who is an Italian lay woman and a self-described security consultant who was contracted by Beichu when he was in the Vatican Secretary of State to assist the Vatican in the liberation of a Colombian nun, a missionary nun who was kidnapped in Mali by Islamic militants in 2017 and then liberated in 2021. Moronia has been accused of being in cahoots with Bechu in diverting some of the money the Vatican put up to ransom this nun for her own personal expenses. The other defendant we heard from this past week, defendants, were Rene Bruhlhart, a Swiss lawyer and anti-money laundering expert, former head of the Vatican's Financial Information Authority, and his deputy, Tommaso Di Ruzza, both of whom have been accused of being in cahoots with some Italian financiers who allegedly tried to bilk the Vatican for tens of millions of dollars in the purchase of a piece of property in London. Now, both of these defense attorneys raised serious objections about the nature of the charges. For instance, the attorneys from Moronia pointed out that she, she is charged with embezzlement. Yet, under Vatican law, to be guilty of embezzlement, you have to be a public official of the Holy See. That is, you have to hold some kind of official office in the Vatican. Moronia was an external consultant. She never heard. She never held any Vatican office. So technically, as a matter of law, she is metaphysically incapable of being guilty of the offense of embezzlement. You know, as far as Bruhlhardt and DeRuzzo are concerned, their lawyers pointed out that if you really want to contend that they conspired with these Italian financiers to bilk the Vatican, then you would have to suggest that they, had, they got some kind of financial gain out of that. The prosecution has never presented even a shred of evidence that these guys benefited in any way, professionally or personally, from signing off on this transaction in London. So it does kind of leave you scratching your heads. Now, both attorneys also raised due process objections. They pointed out, for instance, that the prosecutor in the case, the Vatican's promoter of justice, an Italian attorney by the name of Alessandro Didi, had a lengthy exchange of messages on WhatsApp with another Italian laywoman who had helped to coach his star witness in this case, Italian Monsignor Alberto Perlasca. Yet those 126 WhatsApp messages have never been entered into evidence. Here's the candidate for soundbite of the year, by the way, a veteran Vatican observer by the name of Father Filippo Di Giacomo former official of the Congregation for the Faith, was asked for his opinion on the trial. And he said of Didi, he said basically Didi, whose entire background is as a secular lawyer, he's never worked in an ecclesiastical environment. 
He said this guy obviously doesn't know what the Vatican and the Catholic Church is all about. And the way he phrased that point was saying, it is abundantly clear that Didi could not tell the difference between a consecrated host and a fried egg. Could not tell the difference between a consecrated host and a fried egg. If you know of a better Catholic soundbite in the last 12 months, I'd love to hear it. Finally this week, Crux's managing editor, Charlie Collins, who suffered a devastating stroke on May 8th and spent five months in the hospital in the UK, has finally been able to return home, been reunited with his wife, Claire, and his two boys. That is great and fantastic news. However, Charlie's needs are not over. Claire and the boys not only are dealing with lost income over the last five months, they also have to reconfigure their home to accommodate Charlie's new needs. We are running a GoFundMe campaign to support Charlie. If you go on the Crux site, you will find his latest update. You will find the link to that GoFundMe campaign. So far, we have raised about $65,000. Now that is due to your incredible generosity, all of you who read Crux and who watch this show. We are eternally grateful, but it really only scratches the surface of the need. So on bended knee and with open heart, I beg you, if you can, please dig deep and try to do what you can for Charlie and his family. He's not only a fantastic journalist, he is a great husband, he's a great father, and he's a great friend. He's a good man, and he deserves your help. And I am asking you, please, if you can, help the guy out. All right, that is our show for this week. You can find full coverage of all of these stories on the Crux site. That is cruxnow.com. Again, cruxnow.com. We will be back here next week. Same bat time, same bat channel with the latest and greatest on the Senate of Bishops and everything else that is going on. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will talk to you again very soon.